and welcome back to another episode of the African Football HQ podcast presented to you by Goal Africa. I'm Medic Shafai and I'm joined by Ed Dove. Transfer deadline day has just concluded and I'm very excited to talk about the most recent transfers. Ed, how was your transfer deadline day? It was pretty good. I'm always a little bit disappointed when one of my favourite African players joins Chelsea or Arsenal. In this case, Thomas Partey moving to Arsenal, the big deal of the day. So, um, slightly mixed feelings about that one, but obviously great to see such a big name African player get such a high profile move. Yeah, and just so many African players have moved this window. And even today, it was very exciting as someone who was covering African football. We're going to get right into it. We're going to start with the biggest move, Thomas Partey to Arsenal. After months of drawn out negotiations, Arsenal decided to pay 50 million for the release clause of Party to Atletico Madrid. Ed, I have a lot to say about Arsenal's side on this, but what are your initial thoughts on the move? Well, if I was an Arsenal fan, which I'm, I'm not, I'd be very, very excited because I think Party is what has been missing from that midfield for a long time. I think he'll be an upgrade on Mohamed Al Neni. I'm afraid to say, and I think he'll he will be a he'll bring experience, he will bring ballast, he will bring discipline to that midfield, and I think he will help Arteta get the best out of the attacking players ahead of him. Uh, at Atletico Madrid, he often played in the mid in a, in a two man midfield in a four four two formation, so I think he will he will find things at Arsenal uh, easier, in fact, in a in a more packed zone there, um, and I'm really just really excited to see how he adapts to the Premier League. A few questions about whether it's whether it is a step up for him, leaving a side who are regularly among the latter stages of the Champions League for a team who uh, probably won't even get there. Um, but I think today it's definitely a day for optimism. Yeah. Just from the Arsenal side, I want to say that they've been in negotiations for months. And at the end of the day, Atletico didn't need to do anything. They decided to pay the release clause, which is what Atletico were asking for for months. So there's very futile negotiations that failed completely and they could have had him for months earlier since the beginning of preseason, but they finally bring him in at the last possible minute. I think it'll be a great move. I just wish he could have been in the team for longer and he definitely would have had a great, a much better start to the season had he been there for preseason. Well, true, but Arsenal haven't been doing too badly without him. And actually, if they knew that if push came to shove on deadline day, they could always um, activate this clause then there was no incentive for them to offer anything better than this clause up to this point. So I, I kind of understand why they tried to approach it in different ways, why they tried to throw in Lucas Torreira, for example. In the end, he did move to Atletico Madrid. Um, but you wonder whether, from Atleti's point of view, Torreira is enough compensation for losing uh, party. Yeah, Atletico, they're usually, they come to a vulnerable position when it comes to big players. And then when they decide to end up leaving the club, we've seen it with Griezmann, so many players... At the end of the day, because either the release clause or the club not being deemed to be that big compared to the likes of Arsenal, who might actually play worse, but might have a larger fan base or be a bigger institution. So that's an obviously obviously a big drawing point for players in leaving Atletico. But, but going back to El Nini and the Arsenal midfield they had, Thomas Partey is going to add so much to that midfield going forward. We think of him a lot as a defensive-minded player, but in terms of actually carrying the ball forward and progressing attacks, I think he's going to be one of the best Arsenal midfielders. Do you agree? Well, I'm, I'm very optimistic, but obviously I wanted to ask you on a, on a personal or an emotional level. A few weeks ago, you gave us a very um, eloquent description of why you supported Arsenal when, part, when uh, El Neni was playing, what his arrival as an Egyptian meant to you. Is the part of you that's a little bit sad to see Partey arriving and El Neni's minutes inevitably likely to be reduced? A little bit. It was a pleasant surprise every time I saw him on the starting lineup, which it was just such a big surprise. But he ended up playing well. I think you can agree with that in both of his games in the Premier League so far and in the other competitions too. But obviously, Party will likely take his starting role. The question is who will partner him and if Arteta will change his formation. Currently, he runs with two central midfielders. So I'm assuming that will be Party and either Shaka or Elneny. But with the departure of Torreira and Guendouzi, it's just up to those three now. With the addition of Willock and maybe uh, Maitland Niles, I think Elneny has a good spot to fight for a starting spot. Yeah, I think he's done enough to demonstrate there's still a role for him at Arsenal. I think if I was Arteta, I'd be linked with Jose Moua, linked with uh, Party. I think one of those is going to provide much more of a defensive contribution, the other one more of an offensive contribution. They ended up with one, and I, I would just question whether Danny Ceballos is the is the best link man they could. He's obviously not the best link man they could get, but whether he is a good enough link man um, to make the connection between the central, more defensive-minded midfielders and the uh, the final third 
but um, we'll have to yeah. see his decision. So Bob's completely skipped my mind. <laughs> so he might take some of them in his minutes too. But I mean, we could see like an, an entire Arsenal attacking lineup. Maybe not entirely, or we can't be entirely, but the midfield and full attack, we could see that happen. Yeah. We'll move on to Eric Maxim Chupomoting moving to Bayern Munich from PSG. We've talked about him before after his heroics in the Champions League against Atalanta to send him through to the semifinals, but he's decided to leave and he signed for the European and German champions Bayern Munich on a one-year deal. What are your thoughts on this move, Ed? Yeah, we did we did talk about him before, didn't we? I remember that. I remember I was there praising him, saying he was a fantastic player, saying that he was underrated, saying that he deserved the plaudits that came his way. And you were there slagging him off, saying that he was overrated, saying that he was a bit of a joke-like character. And now he's been signed by the European champions. That's a strange one. That Bayern, obviously, their recruitment department clearly agree with me when it comes to assessing Chupamotig. You must have fallen off your seat when you saw this one get over the line. If you think of all the African players this window who are being targeted by Bayern Munich and PSG, I don't think Eric Maxim Chupamotig would have came to mind. Ed. You have to he's agree a with there. Finalist. He's a multi-time league on winner. He is a player who, as he's proven recently, can make the difference in the big games. Who else are you going to find who's six foot two with a touch like that, able to play across the front line, able to make a contribution in the air, or going in behind with experience, happy to be a team player, happy to be a squad player, a rotational option. As I've, I've tried to tell you many times, there is a place in modern football for a player like that, and that place right now is Bayern Munich's bench. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, apparently some of those attributes like height and ability on the ball suited him well for Bayern because apparently he's going to be the so-called understudy to Robert Lewandowski. I'm not sure if he has room to improve in that aspect, but I guess they do have a bit of a similar build in that they're both tall, decent on the ball. Triple Moting leaves a, a bit to be desired on the finishing edge, as uh, I'm sure you can agree. But <laughs> quality players like Chubomotic, there's always something to learn. And I, I really can see him flourishing back in Germany as well, knows the league well. Yeah. I impressed there before he moved to, to Stoke. Um, so I think this one could be a, a bit of a masterstroke for the same reasons why we talked about why I believe that Andre Ayu could have been his replacement at PSG. I think that Chupamotig could be a hit at, um, at Bayern. The only concern perhaps I would have is, is for the future of uh, Joshua Xerxes, um, who has been understudying. Uh, Lewandowski and obviously the arrival of Chupamoti represents competition, severe competition for him. Uh, on deadline day, Xerxes was linked, I think, with a move to Bayer Leverkusen. Um, as things stand, that hasn't gone ahead. So it will be interesting to see whether the arrival of Chupamoti limits or stimmies his, his progress and his, his potential. Malik, I want to ask you about some of North Africa's movers on deadline day. We saw three notable North African wingers moving clubs. Um, Idrisi was signed by Sevilla in a, a €5 million euro deal. Uh, Adam Unas quit Napoli. And also Rashid Ghazal left Leicester City finally for Besiktas. Um, these three players, perhaps uh, Idrisi, I think, has overachieved compared to what we expected. The other two, you could argue, have, have underachieved based on what was expected of them a few years ago. Um, which of the buying clubs do you think will be in the, the happiest position here with these three? I would disagree with you about Idrissi, just to start off. I thought he had a lot of potential growing up, and if anything, I thought out of all of these three players, I thought it was him who had, who had left the most to be desired with his playing career. But Idrissi at only 24, I think, uh, he's coming off the back of a fine season, having scored 13 goals. For him, this feels like a, a natural progression up, whereas the other two... It feels like they are, are very much trying to claw back a bit of the lost glory that, um, you know, for these, these two players who have lost their way. Yeah, so with the case of the two Algerian wingers, unsu multiple unsuccessful moves in quick succession. So it hasn't been great for their careers. Unas, we saw him at Lyon, played decently well there. Napoli didn't turn out so well, but hoping he can get a better start at a bit of a lower level of Serie A club in Cagliari. So hopefully he'll get more minutes, be able to get more attacking chances. And maybe that can get him back in uh, Jamel Belmadi's good books for the next Algeria squad. Uh, but, you know, him and Gazelle, he had, Gazelle didn't have a great time at Leicester. Hopefully he can, the Turkish league has proved to be a good spot for African players who are in like a midway point in their career. So I'm hoping for that. But, you know, compared to Riyad Mahrez, neither of these guys are getting in the team, are they? <laughs> you, could, you could see why Leicester signed Gazelle very ostensibly as a right-footed left winger to replace uh, Mares. Um, but I don't think I saw enough from, 
from Gazal in France to suggest that he would be a player who would successfully make that move up and and would could take his game to another level at Leicester. I may be proved wrong, but I think that um, what he was achieving in Ligue 1, that's probably his level, really. And I think the shit das for him is actually a pretty good next step in his career. Moving away from transfer deadline day, we are now going to look at the whole window and we are going to pick out some of the African transfers that we think are going to be the biggest success stories, the moves that we are most excited about coming to fruition. Malik, uh, loads of deals to pick from during the window. Where are you going to go with this one? Uh, my three nominees are Ashraf Hakimi to Inter Milan, Umar Sadiq, a transfer deadline move to Almeria in the Spanish second division, and Edward Mendy to Chelsea. I think the uh, explanations for Hakimi and Mendy are quite clear, so I'll start with Sadiq. The Nigerian striker he couldn't break through at Roma, but he moved to Serbia at uh, Partizan, and he's been incredible there, one of the best performers in the league. And he finally got a move to one of the big five European countries, although it wasn't to a big five league. So he'll be playing in the Spanish second division with Almeria. Uh, they used to, they were previously playing in La Liga, so he's hoping that they can get promoted with them. But he's still a young striker. I know you're a big fan of Nigerian strikers, and I'm assuming he has lots, a lot of room to grow. So I'm very excited for this move. Yeah, he scored four goals in six games at the 2016 Summer Olympics for, for Nigeria. And that was really a time when, when he was expected to kind of explode onto the scene after that. Uh, I remember a move to Rangers, a lone move didn't go well. He, he was sent home. That, that was curtailed early because he, he, he didn't impress Steven Gerrard in his first few games. Um, and after that, I well, think during his, his career, really, there have been a lot of low moves, struggled to break through. I'm glad, I'm glad that he found his level at Partizan. I'm glad that he didn't stay there. I'm glad that he's moved back to, to Western Europe. Um, and we'll see if he, can, if he can come close to achieving his potential. I think he could be a really a useful, useful signing. Um, but a long way to go, I'm afraid, on that one. Yes. Next player, Ashraf Kimi, impressed on his Serie A debut. Uh, had a goal and assist, I believe. He might have had two assists, but... A very convincing performance from him, from him and Inter Milan as they won 5-1, I believe. And I think it's going to show how good they're going to be this season. I'm very excited to see Hakimi and Inter this season, Ed. Are you? I think I can agree with you on Hakimi. Obviously. I think he's, he's made my three-man shortlist for this segment as well. Um, I, I've tried to go for players who I think both will improve the club they are, they're signing for and who I think could improve themselves. I think that's, that's one area where Hakimi really... Um, stands out because even though I, I was a little bit disappointed that he didn't stick around at Real Madrid and try and break through there um, I think I'm really excited to see how he does it into Milan and specifically under Antonio Conte as part of this new project I'm intrigued by your selection of Mendy I think I think maybe there's a little bit of a danger that a lot of people are overrating Mendy because of how poor Kepa is and so it's almost like you could you could kind of stick anyone in there and uh, they'd be an upgrade on on Kepa and would solve the problem and I think Mendy is a is a very solid keeper, is a very talented keeper. But I just wonder whether in the Premier League nowadays you need to have um, a certain level of elite keeper to really take things to another level. And so therefore I question whether Mendy is really is really the man to take Chelsea to exactly where they want to be. Although obviously he's a he's a, an upgrade on um, the the multi million pound keeper. I don't know why you have doubts already. In two games. Uh, the penalty shootout didn't turn out so well, but he kept a clean sheet in his Premier League debut. I'm seeing very little negative so far, so I'm a bit concerned uh, by your viewpoints, to be honest. <laughs> I also want that defence, because it's one thing coming in as, a, as an established keeper, or you know, coming in as a keeper who doesn't know the league, who doesn't know the country, and finding yourself playing behind a solid defence. But I don't think all of Kepa's problems were Kepa's fault, if that makes sense. I think certainly the, the defence ahead of him uh, didn't help matters. Um, which is remarkable that we're saying this, considering they, they do have N'Golo Kante protecting them. Um, but I feel like even if long-term Chilwell proves to be a, a good addition, which I, I think he will be, and even if Thiago Silva does bring some of his PSG form to Premier League, which I'm, I'm not sure he will do, um, it's going to take time for this defence to bet in. And I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on Mendy over the coming weeks and months. And I, I, I just don't know if this one's set up to be a success. At the moment he's in right now, it's not looking too good for Kepa. So I think Mendy doesn't have to work too hard in order to keep that starting spot. As long as he doesn't make too many screw-ups or any, I think he has that starting spot to himself. I would have expected Kepa to go out on loan. We were hearing some rumors about that. But it seems like we'll have a pretty strong competition for Chelsea's number one spot. 
Well, Liverpool need a new number two, so maybe they could look at uh, bringing Kepper in as a backup to Alisson, perhaps. It might be an upgrade on, uh, on uh, Adrian, I'm not sure. Debatable. Okay, Hakimi's also made my three-man shortlist. Um, I'm also going to go for Nef Agued, uh, Morocco centre-back, who uh, left Dijon for, for Stade René, joining the club that Edouard Mendy is leaving. Um, really cultured centre-back. I think he's, 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 he's a multi-dimensional defender. Um, someone who's impressed at Dijon, even though he didn't fully, in my opinion, get as much playing time as he deserved. But he nonetheless got a step up to, to Rennes and will now play in the Champions League next season or this season. And I think that's a, a kind of natural next step for him. He was only playing in the bottle as recently as 2018 um, with uh, Fusrabat. And uh, I think it's fantastic to see a player progressing from African football to the Champions League so quickly. And I think Aguero deserves um, the plaudits that come his way with this, this meteoric rise. And the third name I'm going to go for is Ghana's Mohamed Kudus. Um, I said before I like players who both will improve the club they're signing for and will improve themselves. And I think that Kudus is a real uh, good example of this. So I think he will, he will be a good addition to this Ajax side, but I also am excited to see how his game progresses and develops, having made the move from Danish football to the Eredivisie and specifically to a club which pride themselves on refining uh, talented young players. Yeah, I talked about Kudus last week. I was very excited about his debut performance and it's looking like it's going to be a good season for him. Uh, like it will for most of these players we're talking about, hopefully. And uh, going back to Agued, he scored him uh, last week, I believe. So a great start for all these African players. And I wasn't predicting Agued to do too, too well, to be honest. But from what he's done so far, it seems like he'll uh, play a pretty solid role for Rene. Yeah, I can't see. I can't wait to see how he adapts to the Champions League. It, it may prove this season to be a really big test for him, but I think longer term, um, I believe he is a player who can who can settle at that level. Um, and as for Kudus, I think what I'm really excited about there is is a central midfielder who averaged just under a goal every other game in Denmark, uh, nine goals in just over twenty appearances. Um, so that's a really promising return for a player who, who's who's been playing central midfield. And if he can translate those numbers to the Eredivisie, uh, Ajax have got a real player on their hands. I think as have Ghana actually, a party Kudus midfield uh, could be one to watch over the next few years. Very exciting indeed. I want to conclude this uh, segment with one transfer we forgot to cover. Algerian AFCON winner Jamel Bin Lamri moving to Olympic Lyon in a shock move by all means, Ed. Shocking. Yeah, we said a three-man shortlist. You've now added in a fourth, so I'm not sure about that in terms of the rules. Um, but credit to him. I mean, early 30s, making the move to French football, not just to French football, but also to a French giant. Uh, won many admirers for his displays during Algeria's run to the AFCON title uh, last summer. I think there were some who expected he'd get a move off the back of that performance. Uh, unlike Aguad, he is a bit more of a stopper, a bit more of a one-dimensional centre-back. Um, very aggressive, very commanding. Um, very assertive. Um, and yeah, it'll be fascinating to see his tussles with uh, Ligue 1's finest strikers. Neymar won't know what's hitting when he comes up against uh, against Jamal. I saw him put in a really, really dirty tackle in the Saudi League two weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> so that, that was the last thought I had of him in my mind. And now seeing him jump to not only Ligue 1, but one of France's greatest teams, considering how far they got in the Champions League last season, what role is he going to play? How is he going to make the jump from the Saudi league to the French league? Uh, with difficulty, I suspect. It's a, it's a move <laughs> that's raised a few eyebrows. Uh, I think all I'd say is expect a few, a few bookings this season. We're going to talk about the transfers of some players who might have shook a few heads. You might not expect that player to have moved there, and you're not sure if that's the best move for their career. There are a few players who might fit this criteria, but Ed, who is your nominee for this section? Okay, I do have a few, a bit of a, a big shortlist here. Um, a few of these players who I'm glad they're making moves, but I'm not necessarily convinced that they're going to be a hit at their new club because of how things went to their previous club. Uh, two names that spring to mind there. Uh, one is, is Jordan Ibe, uh, of who left Bournemouth a free agent during the summer and has now signed for Derby County in the Championship. In principle, it's a deal that makes a lot of sense. I definitely does have potential, um, but I just don't know if, if that player is there anymore or whether that, that promise has gone. Uh, another one would be Mbwana Samata moving to uh, Fenerbahce in the Super League. I think this one could be a hit. 
I do think Samat is a, an excellent player and I think that this is a, a good step up to where he was maybe a year ago in the Belgian Jupiler League. Um, but he struggled so profoundly in the Premier League with Aston Villa, despite some big expectations. So I am uh, a little bit worried about, about whether he can rediscover that form. I think hopefully he needs a few big performances off the bat. He needs a few goals. Hopefully he can settle in. Hopefully he's a player who can raise his game um, to the demands of playing for Fenerbahce. But um, I suspect his confidence is going to be is going to be low after that time at, at Villa. And the third name I'm going to go for is Habib Diallo, um, Senegal striker, impressed at Mess last season and moved uh, on deadline day to uh, Racing Club Strasbourg d'Alsace, my beloveds, uh, in a 10 million euro move. Now, there's been a lot of talk around this deal because on deadline day, because apparently I understand that the player is unhappy with the move to Strasbourg. He's made that public. He wanted to go elsewhere. Sheffield United were linked with a move for his services. Um, it even looked on deadline day that he would go to Bramall Lane for 15 million. He ended up going to Strasbourg and it, it doesn't go down well with your new club fans when you say that you don't really want to be there, especially after they've spent so much money. So uh, yeah. I'm worried that you won't be able to turn that one around. Well, I want to talk about Samada. We've talked about his struggles at Villa before, but I'm very excited by this move. I would say that Samada is probably one of the most popular players in the world when you consider the subset of Tanzanian fans he has and how how much of a star he is there. And then considering his move to Fenerbahce, who have some of the craziest supporters in the world and are one of the most uh, well-supported clubs in European football, I think it's a great move on all ends when you're looking at it from like a social media perspective. It's but on the football powder, side... Powder keg. How, how, imagine the clashes. Imagine the street warfare between Fenerbahce supporters on Instagram and on Twitter and these Tanzanian supporters on... Imagine the blocking that's going to go on. Imagine well, the They're on the same side. Well, they are for now. They are for now. But once Fenerbahce fans start criticising Samata, or once his play, his teammates don't pass to him, and they're getting abused by Tanzania, I don't know, mate. I think this one's going to end in tears, to be honest. There's too many, too many volatile elements there for me. <laughs> I don't know how the Tanzanians will think about you calling them volatile. Same for the Turkish too. But he scored on his debut, so he's off to a great start already. Um, I'm very excited well, by the Africans in Turkish fans, league. Tanzanian fans proved that the abuse they aimed at Aston Villa players, and Aston Villa themselves as a club, uh, and any fans who criticised... I mean, Samata, you're right, he's very popular. Anyone who speaks out against Samata, not very popular. And uh, I, I, I worry. I worry about these skirmishes that are going to take place, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think Villa lost like 50k followers on Instagram in the 24 hours after Samata left, but we might be seeing these battles in the, on the keyboards, not in the field, Ed. I hope, I mean, for the sake of my Twitter and, uh, and Instagram following, I hope he's a major success. Fantastic player. Probably my favourite East African player and maybe even Africa's greatest striker. All right. Well, uh, in terms of players who might have had moves that weren't the best for them, I was a bit more optimistic. I only nominated one player, and that is Bertrand Traore to Aston Villa from Olympic Lyon. Uh, Bert, we could talk a lot about Traor, you know, didn't have the best times at Chelsea. We expected him to be a really great player for him and Burkina Faso. But if anything, he'll leave a sour taste in the memory of Chelsea fans as he was the reason they got a transfer ban. At Lyon, he was decent. Uh, his last memory was uh, missing the penalty, decisive penalty shootout, decisive penalty in the shootout against PSG in the cup final. But on his move to Aston Villa, I'm a bit confused by it. It was a very big fee. And they already have so many wingers, Ed. I'm saying this primarily because Trezeguet is there and I'm hoping he doesn't take any of his minutes, but I don't really see where he fits into this, uh, into this team. If anything, I thought he should move to a different team where he would have a solidified starting spot. Yeah, I can see, obviously, this one's motivated entirely by a concern about Trezeguet's playing time. <laughs> I don't think it's a really good reason to dismiss a potential transfer. Um, I'll tell you why he fits in. He fits in because players who can play in wide areas and score goals are valuable commodities. And <laughs> Bertrand Traore, as Trezeguet did last season, can offer that threat. I'd, I'd also say, I'm surprised you've gone for this one because you can't really blame him for not succeeding at Chelsea when he, he was just a kid when he signed and he didn't truly get the opportunity, only briefly uh, got the opportunity to impress there. But also, I really think, and I'm not just saying this because Villa smashed Liverpool 7-2, but I also think that Villa are a team on the up. And I think the <laughs> chemistry between Grealish, between Barkley, the arrival of Ollie Watkins, this is suddenly an exciting project to be a part of. And I think Traore could, um, 
could finally realise some of the potential that we we'd hoped for when he was he was a much younger player. But he's going to be coming off the bench, Ed. Like there's Trezeguet, Grealish, El Ghazi, uh, Jota, I believe. Where where does he like? He's going to come off the bench surely at the beginning. Uh, yeah, perhaps, but it's going to be a very condensed set, uh, schedule this this season. Um, there's obviously going to be cup games. Games are much tighter together. There's going to be a testing winter period. Uh, we've seen squads being hit with players absent through COVID. Um, you don't know who else might leave before the, uh, the, 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 the window for internal transfers, domestic transfers ends. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly confident that having paid that much money, uh, Traore has a big part to play in Dean Smith's plans this season. We've talked extensively about the players who have secured moves both on deadline day and during the rest of the window. But unfortunately, there are some players who we've been tipping to make moves. We've been hoping they would make moves. But unfortunately, they remain at their current employers. Uh, lots of names we could talk about here, Malik. But who, who stands out for you? Who are the players who you really expected would get something done? But ultimately, they remain at their current employers. Uh, I'm going to start with the two championship starlets in Said Ben Rama and Ismail Asar. Uh, Saar relegated, Ben Rama close to getting promoted, but both of them will be playing or are likely to be playing in the championship this season after they didn't get a move to the Premier League. Ben Rama, it seemed very likely either Leicester, West Ham, Chelsea were all linked to him at a certain point, but the move never went through. And it seems like he's going to stay at Brentford, despite, I think you can agree how much better he is in the quality of the championship. And then Ismail Saar. Uh, this was a bit of a weird one, you know, because he didn't prove that much in the Premier League, to be honest. And then he didn't have that many grounds to demand to move, despite uh, what we saw from him in League One before and the transfer fee he demanded. So United were linked to him today. They tried to get a move for him, but it couldn't get completed. So I'm very upset to see these two players likely stay in the championship. Which of them surprised you more? Because you and I have talked about both of these guys um, on the brink of moves. Obviously, Arsenal as well were linked with Ben Rama. He had at one point a host of it was it was a question of of when and not if. Um, which of them are you more surprised to see uh, still in the championship at this stage? Yeah, I have to say Ben Rama. Just, he was one of the best players in the league last season, and he didn't get a move. With all these cases they always end up getting moved to some bigger club or if they don't get promoted. So Brentford, they have a great system, obviously. Uh, they got off to a good start and Ben Rama had a crazy brace. One of his goals was just incredible. Nutmeg, rocket finish. So he's already back to his antics, but I, I think he's just at a higher level in the championship. I think he should be playing in the Prem. And he was linked to moves for months. And like you said, it was a question of, uh, of when, not if. So I was very upset to see him not move. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that. Even though on deadline day, it did look like Saar was the subject of, of intense interest from Manchester United. I, I still think overall, I was much more surprised that Ben Rama didn't get a move. He had a hand in 26 goals in the championship last season. He seemed, it, it was the time was right, I think, for him to make a move, to take that next step. Um, and I'm just stunned that no one came in for him. Because I really think that a player of, a player of those such rare qualities, able to add an end product, um, able to really change a game, there should have been such a place for a player like that. West Ham, Leicester, both were, were potential destinations that made complete sense. Um, and I wonder if either or both of them will regret not making a move for him during the window. Uh, another player I want to mention is Khalidou Koulibaly. Uh, there weren't that many strong links linking him to an exit to Napoli, but we saw him linked to Liverpool, Manchester City. The moves were a bit unlikely, but nothing, uh, nothing ever materialised. I'm hoping he can have a better season than last season's at Napoli, but uh, I'm just a bit concerned about what's next for him, Ed. Yeah, I think the Koulibaly uh, to City was the one that I think had looked really on at one point. Then they signed, obviously, Ake. Then they signed also Ruben Diaz. That obviously shut the door there. Um, but I was still surprised that, that United, for example, desperate for, for someone to take responsibility, someone commanding at centre-back. Um, and they just didn't move. They allowed Smalling to leave. They, they, they are now shaping up to at least um, three months with, with Maguire, Eric Bailly, Lindelof at centre-back. It's an absolute disaster. And I think Kalibli would have been an upgrade, a significant upgrade on those three. Also, PSG have allowed Thiago Silva to leave. Um, and you just wonder whether, whether Kalibli, they, they may regret missing out on Kalibli. Well, I think from, from PSG's point of view, they may be fairly confident they can get through till January without needing to sign an elite centre-back. 
knowing that potentially that option will be there for them midway through the season. Yeah, I want to highlight the, the gaffe Manchester City's social media team made when they announced the signing of Ruben Diaz is on their website on the official announcement. They had links linking uh, to Khalidou Koulibaly's new jersey and photos of him in the Manchester City jersey. So it seems like uh, Pep really wanted him and they thought they were going to get him, but it didn't end up happening and they went with Diaz instead. But it was very funny to see how close it could have been. Yeah, very weird that we got that glimpse behind the scenes of I mean, I just how do, how does something get to that stage before someone realizes that an error has been made? I find that I find that absolutely stunning. Um, One thousand retweets. How long in advance of a deal getting over the line do you start writing that kind of stuff in anticipation on your website? Very very strange one. I think whereas I would say that Saar, um, Benarama, and Kulibli all have quite bright futures, my shortlist of guys are players who I think should be very concerned about what the immediate future holds for them. I'm going to shortlist uh, Victor Moses of Chelsea, Abdurrahman Baba of Chelsea, uh, Yannick Balassi of Everton, and even maybe Islam Slimani of of Leicester City. All of these guys have no future at their current employers. Uh, Moses has been told it this week by by Frank Lampard, who says there's no role to play. Ancelotti said the same about Balassi. It's clear that Slimani is not in Brendan Rodgers' plans, and Baba is... Is so far away from being Chelsea's uh, first choice left back. It's it's actually sad. Um, so I think these guys, really talented players. They've all been talented players not that long ago, um, but at the moment they're all sh- staring at six months on the sidelines. Unfortunately. Yeah, Samani is the most shocking one to me, considering I think he's had the best season out of all the players we've mentioned, uh, besides potentially Barb and Rama. Uh, I think thirteen goals in league on. But he's gonna now he's gonna be what the third choice striker at Leicester. Not really not gonna be seeing any minutes. I don't know who his agent is, but that's a big uh, mistake to not let him get get out of get out of there. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised maybe that no one took him earlier in the window. Like on on the, on on deadline day, he was linked, I think, with the move to West Bromwich Albion. Uh, and I can understand why he'd want a player of that presence, of that experience, uh, even if perhaps he hasn't yet done it in the Premier League. Um, but I think there'll be very big money involved there and also at 32 uh, plus in England he has had injury problems so I think these are things that are counting against him for me the most surprising of the three is is Victor Moses because he's he's 29 he's a recent Premier League winner he was playing for Inter Milan last season uh, Fenerbahce during the first half of the campaign and now you're telling me that there's not one club who can strike a deal to bring him on versatile he's still got legs um, I'm, I'm stunned like why aren't like someone like a West Ham? I know he's been there before, but someone like a West Ham kind of level, uh, looking at a player like that who represents a really good option in wide areas, and I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah. What about Balassi? Uh, he's had a few loan spells since coming to Everton, but the thing we can admit, he hasn't been the player we thought he would end up becoming. Well, injuries. It all, it all started so well for him after he arrived from Crystal Palace. Excellent link up with Lukaku. Incidentally, Moses also had an excellent link up with Lukaku at um, at Inter Milan. Uh, but obviously devastating injury out for over a year. Um, hasn't been the play- same player since. Uh, you, could, you could question whether he could still be the same player since if he'd had the right opportunities. Um, obviously, there was that infamous incident where he decided to cancel his own loan move at, at Aston Villa in order to try and uh, break into the Everton team. That didn't work out. He's been told he doesn't have a, a future. Um, and now in his early 30s, it's a case of, I think, one, one fresh start somewhere else. And hope for the best, really, sadly. There's only a few footballers in the world who have a skill move named after him. He, he truly deserves better. So does so does Aidan McGeady, but he was last seen playing for Sunderland in the third tier. So uh, a skill move being named after you, I can assure you, uh, doesn't mean all that much, unfortunately. That is all we've got time for. Thank you so much for joining us on African Football HQ. It's been a pleasure recapping the deadline day and the transfer window. And join us again later this week for some fascinating international football talk.